Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? I got a pair of smaller than normal retro ThinkPads, but each has its own share of problems. Let's see if I can put the two together and end up with a functional machine. These specifically are ThinkPad 240s, a sub-notebook model released by IBM in June of 1999. If you've watched my channel for a while, you probably know I'm fond of small laptops like these. And even though neither of the two units I was given are perfect, they're compelling enough that I decided I was up for a challenge. The first 240 seems to work fine. It powers on and starts to boot from its hard drive and briefly shows a Windows 98 splash screen, but ultimately ends up at a DOS prompt. Looks like the Windows directory is missing entirely. I wonder if maybe someone did this in a hasty attempt at deleting data. Ports on subnotebooks are usually limited, but not in the case of the 240. On the back, there's Serial, Parallel, and VGA. The left side hosts a 56K modem, Kensington lock slot, external floppy drive connector, audio in and out jacks, and a single PC card slot. The right side has a PS2 port, infrared transceiver window, and single USB 1.0 socket. And that is this 240's main functional problem. It looks like someone damaged it as the middle plastic piece is missing. It's an important part as it keeps the pins inside the connector aligned and prevents them from shorting. So I need to explore fixing it. Otherwise, the machine just has some cosmetic flaws, the biggest of which is a crack in the screen bezel. It isn't necessarily a problem, but if I'm going to the trouble of fixing this one up, I might as well take care of it, too. Conveniently, the second 240 I was given can serve as a great source of parts, and I can do so guilt-free as it seems to have a dead motherboard and won't power on. It's got an intact screen bezel and appears to be complete otherwise, so hopefully it'll have everything I need. Time to get the first machine disassembled. The ThinkPad 240 was known to have lackluster battery life, and there's an obvious reason why. Despite using lithium-ion chemistry, it offered a paltry 1400 milliamp hour capacity. There just wasn't room for a bigger pack. And underneath it was something curious. Someone had covered the metal frame with marker, perhaps in an attempt to cover over personal information. I'll need to remember to deal with this later. Next up was removing the hard drive. There are two screws that secure it, then it slides to the left and lifts out. This one shows that the machine has seen some repairs over its lifetime, with this used part sticker and a label suggesting it was from early 2001. The keyboard needed to come out next, which was secured with three screws through the bottom. It lifts up from the back, then I could flip it onto the palm rest. I removed a retaining screw, then disconnected its flat flex cable from the motherboard. Unfortunately, that was the end of the easy part. In order to access the USB port, I'd need to completely disassemble the rest of the machine. Two screws needed to come out from inside the battery compartment, then I could carefully pop the display hinge covers free using a spudger. This revealed the screws holding the screen on, but first I needed to disconnect it from the motherboard and pry up the copper tape, securing it in place. After that, I could remove the four display hinge screws, then carefully pry up the top case to free the cable and set the screen aside. That top case was next. Two screws hide under the display hinges, then I got the track point button cable disconnected. Another pair of screws are on the bottom, one by the hard drive and another hidden underneath a cover on the front edge. Then it was a matter of carefully prying it up from the right side, trying not to break any plastic clips. Once free, I got the speaker cable unplugged. While the clips on the top case survived, this screw standoff for the hard drive didn't. I'll need to deal with this later. 
The ThinkPad 240 advertised having built-in drainage to help if a drink was spilled on it, and this plastic channel routes liquids out the front of the chassis. The keyboard drains into this bowl shape in the top case, and a hole in the bottom interfaces with the channel. It of course doesn't mean one could be careless with the laptop, but this setup does look like it would be at least somewhat helpful at keeping liquid off the motherboard and reducing the amount of resulting damage. To get the motherboard out, I needed to next disconnect this button board and remove the screw that secured it. That screw was also part of the heatsink assembly, which I could pry up and unplug. The screws holding in the external drive connector came out next, along with a couple others in the middle of the motherboard. Finally, I flipped the machine over and removed the five fasteners holding the inner metal chassis to the bottom case plastics. From there, it was just a matter of gently prying the two apart. This finally gave me access to that damaged USB port. It's manufactured by Foxconn and sits in a notch in the PCB. On each side are mounting legs that are soldered through the board to give it strength, and considering the inside of the port broke, I'd say they did a good job. Normally I'd simply look up this part from an electronics distributor and buy a replacement, but in this case I couldn't find one that matched. It's seemingly been discontinued with no suitable substitute. Good thing I have a second computer with a dead motherboard to salvage the part from. The IR transceiver is located awfully close to one side of the port, so I decided to remove it to make more room. I applied some flux, then used a desoldering iron to clear each of the through-hole joints, and the module came free. Next, I desoldered the USB connector's pins with the help of some braid, then freed the mounting legs. With just a bit more help from the iron, I got the last little bits of solder molten, and the connector came away. But I made a mistake in the process. On the good part, I accidentally broke off two of the pins. They were a lot more fragile than I was anticipating. Thankfully, not all hope was lost as I realized that the connectors themselves could be disassembled. Not only could the outer metal housing be separated from the inner plastic, but doing so also allowed one to remove each of the pins individually. I carefully transplanted two of them from the broken connector to the uh, other broken connector. When I said I'd be combining parts from two laptops to make one complete unit, this isn't exactly what I had in mind. But it worked, and that's all that matters. I was able to solder the connector into the good motherboard and put the IR transceiver back in place. Then came one final parts trade between the boards the magnesium frame. Swapping them would let me avoid having to clean all that marker off that we saw earlier, and only involve dealing with the standoffs from the rear ports. The motherboard in the working machine came with a RAM upgrade, a 128 megabyte stick of PC66, which was IBM branded, but made by Toshiba. There's 64 megabytes soldered to the motherboard, so this gives the machine its official maximum of 192 megabytes, though some have found that 256 meg sticks could work too. I used super glue meant specifically for plastics to repair that broken top case standoff. I don't normally add baking soda to the glue as doing so makes it thicker and interfere with the fit between the parts. This was a clean break and glued back together just fine. I would have simply used the top case from the parts laptop, except it had a broken off clip and a crack of its own. Reassembling the machine was as straightforward as taking it apart. I was mindful of not bending plastics any more than I needed to, and also to ensure that I was putting the screws back where they came from, as they had different lengths. When the base was done, I could turn my attention to the screen, specifically this crack in the bezel. It would have been easy to simply swap over the display from the parts machine, except its rear housing had some wear that I wasn't thrilled about. So that meant I'd need to swap just the bezels. There are four screws holding the display together, and they're all hidden by stick-on covers. I used a craft knife to carefully pry them out. 
there are two at the bottom of the screen, and then another two on the sides towards the top. I used a spudger to carefully release the clips holding the bezel to the rear housing, working my way around the display. I was surprised to find that I didn't break any, considering these machines seem to be otherwise starting to suffer from brittle plastics. Curiously, I found a random extra screw cover stuck to the metal frame of the LCD panel. Perhaps this machine saw a screen replacement at some point in its past, which could explain the cracked bezel. With the display reassembled, I got it fitted back onto the laptop uneventfully. I worked my way through the machine, putting parts back where they should, and generally reversing the way I had taken it apart. Then came the moment of truth. I plugged it in, opened the screen, and pressed the power button. The 240 booted up just like before, which was a big relief, as it meant I had at least not made anything worse. I wouldn't be able to fully test that USB port until I got Windows reinstalled, so I focused on that next. Included with the machine were two external drives. The first was the floppy, which plugs into the drive connector on the left side. The other was an external CD-ROM drive, which uses a PC card to IDE adapter. Both drives are interesting in that the mechanism can be removed from the housing. In the case of the floppy drive, it's a standard ThinkPad Ultra Slim Bay module, so it's likely that this was just a cost-saving measure on IBM's part. The larger enclosure had a 24-speed CD-ROM, and its internal IDE interface means other modules, like zip drives, could be swapped in. There's only two connectors on it, analog audio out from the CD-ROM, and the IDE interface from the PC card. This suggests that it's bus-powered, but when I inserted the card and started the laptop, the drive wasn't recognized. And even worse, it wouldn't open the disk tray either. On the bottom of the enclosure is a battery compartment for so-called supplemental power, and I dropped in a set of AA batteries, but that didn't make a difference. I figured maybe the slightly lower voltage from the rechargeables I used wasn't enough, so I replaced them with a set of brand new disposable lithium batteries. But still, the drive just didn't respond at all. Some research found that others have faced this same issue too, with no obvious fix. So I'd need to find another way to get an OS on this laptop. Thankfully, I had a trick up my sleeve. I was planning on reinstalling Windows 98, and that OS has the neat ability to be installed from the hard drive itself. I hooked the drive up to a USB to IDE adapter. These are incredibly handy, especially the ones that have the appropriate connector for a laptop drive. From there, I was able to connect it to my modern ThinkPad and copy over the Windows 98 setup files. I've done a video explaining this process in detail, and I'll include a link if you want to learn more. While it was connected, I also copied over all the drivers that I could find for this model. And as soon as that was done, the drive began to make some ominous sounds, and a moment later, it stopped responding entirely. Since I had a parts laptop, I tried hooking up its hard drive, but it sounded even worse and wasn't recognized at all. Okay, I found a 20 gigabyte drive in my parts bin. Also a travel star, but from after Hitachi bought IBM's hard disk division and got the files copied over. Luckily, the floppy drive still worked, so I could get the machine booted and kick off the Windows installation. Getting the drivers loaded let me test out what I was most interested in, that USB port I replaced. I plugged in a modern optical mouse, and to my relief, Windows recognized it. After selecting the correct driver, the mouse worked fine, and I was thankful that all the effort hadn't gone to waste. Subnotebooks were rarely known for high performance, and this ThinkPad 240 is no exception. It features a 300 MHz Intel Celeron processor, though 366 and 400 MHz versions were also available. The display is a 10.4-inch TFT panel with a resolution of 800 by 600 
but the Neo Magic graphics chip driving it is fairly weak. It only offers two megabytes of video RAM and doesn't have 3D acceleration, so playing contemporary Windows games is pretty limited. Quake 3 wouldn't even launch. For DOS games, sound is then the priority for some retro enthusiasts, and with its ESS Solo Audio Drive chipset, the 240 produces MIDI results that some will like and others will hate. I'll let you decide for yourself. But this machine wasn't built for gaming, it was built for business, as most ThinkPads were. Subnotebooks never really gained large market share in the US, with buyers gravitating towards laptops with larger screens and more comfortable keyboards. But unlike some of IBM's other subnotebooks, the 240 was released in North America, and at its launch was the smallest and lightest machine the company had offered in the region. Yet the 240 managed to maintain a good level of usability. While some of its competitors were comically small, its screen remained readable, the keyboard didn't feel cramped, and the Celeron CPU was just fast enough for the machine to feel responsive. Chief among reviewers' complaints, though, were its relatively dim backlight and poor battery life of just about an hour, which were pretty serious problems given the machine's starting price of $2,000 US. With a not-so-compelling value like that, it's probably no surprise that the 240 didn't sell terribly well, so used ones don't come up for sale very frequently these days. When they do, they command a decent price, though not as high as some better-known machines from their era. And despite its shortcomings, I still rather like the 240. Its weight of under 3 pounds or just over a kilogram feels light compared to its footprint, and it has the typical solid ThinkPad build quality. I'll need to do some further research to figure out how to get the optical drive functional again, but that's not urgent. Having a working USB port will certainly tide me over for a while. If you like the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.